but uh, it is my yeah it is a a book um i suppose it's my last book um okay so let, look, looking at the title first intoxicating shanghai and urban montage art and literature in victoria magazines during shanghai's jazz age if we add to that uh, the art and literature if we add cinema and music and we add the name 1934 we have pretty much everything about the book that um, there is to say um, and i will be introducing the book um, which is in four parts uh, bit by bit okay So it's called an urban montage, and a lot of the focus is on montage, both in uh, visual montage and uh, textual. Uh, and this is where it starts. As we can see, this is a, a photo montage where the photographs are taken by Chen, Chen Jiajun. And this uh, is called, in English, Intoxicated Shanghai. But um, I chose this title for my book, but changed it slightly to Intoxicating Shanghai, just because it sounded a bit better. Uh, for no other reason than that. But what we see here are all the um, aspects that really, well, not all of them, but a lot of the aspects that I'll actually be talking about. By the way, if I look over to the sites, because I have another screen, it's not that I'm doing anything strange. Okay, so, I mean, in particular, what we have is, um, let me, yeah, hang on, there we are. Uh, in particular, we have jazz and dance you know these are performers in in dance halls uh, or in cabarets and then we have cinema here with um king kong uh, a very well-known poster that is actually has actually been sort of sliced up to um make king kong face the opposite direction anyway i mean if you know that uh, poster it is quite strange how they've uh, dealt with it and then we have all the things that um that a lot of the things that enter into what I talk about. And in particular here, we can see the, the Hialai Stadium. Um, and uh, you, that's one of the first things I'll be talking about actually, because it comes uh, in, uh, well, in the next slide. This is the front cover of the book. And I'm very, uh, very, de I'm delighted that uh, I, actually met Ye Qian Yu's son, who gave me permission to use this photograph by Ye Qian Yu uh, for the front cover. Um, and, you know, I'd like to thank him here. I don't think he's actually at, at, at the talk, but, um, but I thank him anyway. Okay, so the, the beginning, the first part. I don't have an, an introductory chapter. I have introductory tra chapters, and there are three of these if we include, so this is Shanghai. So this is Shanghai is based around the montage that I just showed you and introduces uh, things as they come using the text that is in the uh, in the montage itself. So it's like an introduction to Shanghai, um, the Shanghai of 1934. And that is uh, the date of the uh, montage. So chapter one, we look at literature and the pictorial magazine. And specifically, the literature we look at is um, that um, written by what a lot of people call the new sensationists. Now, uh, I, I know that there are many ways of referring to these writers, and I know some people don't like that, um, that term being used for them. What I don't like in particular is uh, some of the terms that are similar to new sensationists. Uh, that are used, such as neo-sensationist, implying we, but beforehand there was a sensationist group, or the other term which I particularly dislike is a uh, new sensationalist, implying that they are sensational writers, and in, that's far from the idea. The idea is that they are experimenting with new sensations, and we'll come into that a little bit later. So uh, one of the things I did for this um, this book which I must say, I, I have to point out, is very unconventional. It's not a standard academic book. Uh, and, you know, this is, of course, very, uh, this is intentional. Um, I had this idea before I wrote it, which I thought was a little uh, far-fetched, of 
translating four stories, translating a number of stories. I didn't have four in mind at the time, and then including them in a book about Shanghai. Uh, and after a while, it sort of stuck in my head, and that's what I did. So this is what that th this is what the book is. It is a book uh, about Shanghai, uh, various aspects of Shanghai, uh, with four short story translations. Uh, so after literature and the Pictorial magazine. Um, I go on to art and the Pictorial magazine. Now, this isn't a, this isn't general uh, a, a general discussion about art at the time. It's more specifically about what some people might term commercial artists, people who are working in the magazines. So, specifically in the magazines, not the art that appears in the magazines, but the art that appears there that is uh, uh, that is produced by people who work for the pictorial magazines in particular. And so what that really means is uh, mostly manhua. Uh, manhua is obviously, is often translated as cartoon, but I'm afraid that is not a very good uh, description really of what it is. Uh, but slowly as we go through, we'll see uh, what that might mean. I, I have to. I have to say, this isn't a. This isn't a book about manhua. My previous book was largely focused on manhua artists, uh, but this is a book about, as I said, art, literature, cinema, and music. And why am I? Why have I written about so, such diverse um, topics? Uh, it's partly just my experience, and that's what we all. Well, that's what we all bring to. Uh, academia is our, our personal experiences so i mean I, I i teach literature i've taught art and i've you know worked at ashmolean uh, cinema is part of the uh, literature and culture that i teach and music i was a professional musician for 25 years so it's not just a question of picking things out of the air it's just i'm uh, out of experience all right so the first story is by he ying uh, and he is an interesting character because he was actually very young when he wrote mo most of his stories that are from the uh, in the so so called new sensationist mode uh he came to china uh, he came to what well, to china and to shanghai because he he was born in sumatra he lived there until he was 18 or so he came to shanghai specifically to uh, study or um be, get fami more familiar with the uh, writings of the new sensations and particularly Mu Shiying. And you can see in his writing a lot of, uh, a lot of influence of Mu Shiying. Okay, so this is a book that I highly recommend if you people, for people who are interested in Shanghai, it's a sort of, um, it's a gazetteer which shows everything in Shanghai in, in pictures. Uh, and one of the things that in particular is, is, is interesting is, to me is the, Moon Palace Dance Hall, because this is one of the places where the the um, the stories of Mushing and of Hanging often take place. So it's nice to be actually be able to see a picture, and that's why I've included it here. Okay, so art and the Pictorial Magazine. So this is the sort of thing we're talking about. Now these would be described, or or the artist Zhang Guangyu would be described as a um, as a manhua artist, but we can see that these really aren't manhua. Uh, you know, they aren't cartoons. They are manhua. They aren't cartoons. Um, in the first one, which is uh, volume one, this one, we can see volume one is written here. Uh, this is a sort of, I wouldn't say it's a theme, but it's a style of uh, drawing and painting that he, he did quite a lot of between the years 1934 and 1936. And I mean, I suggest we, we could call it sort of a surrealist inspired. Um, we can see various aspects of um, surrealist painting that are used in here, in particular Yves Tongyi and his, uh, some of his globular shapes. In the second um, issue is this one. And this is one where um, Xiao Ning mentioned Miguel Covarrubias and Zhang Guangyu met Miguel Covarrubias, the year before these magazines came out. Um, and he was a, a great inspiration for him. He had been an inspiration for, for years before, at least, at least a year before that. So when uh, Miguel Covarrubias visited Shanghai, he, he managed to, uh, Zhang Guangyu, through Shao Xunne, uh, this publisher um, who, and a mutual friend, uh, got to know Covarrubias. And although this isn't uh, the clearest of the, uh, 
the artworks that I would say are um, show an influence of Miguel Covarrubias, uh, this is this does in a number of ways. The third one is interesting because uh, the third issue was not um, published until a year after the second, and those are the only issues that are that were ever published. So it is this magazine and the following magazine that are the real focus of uh, my uh, book, although uh, I do concentrate on others as well, Shudai Manhua as well, um, and Liang Yeo, Ba Ba. Okay. Next slide, there we are. So this is the second uh, magazine that I look at. This is Wuni Huaba, and we see two covers, by uh, two striking covers, I think, by two important artists in my research. One is uh, the, the one who's perhaps best known uh, is Zhou Dor, that's the one on the right. Uh, and I say that only because uh, most people who work in the area of Chinese art will have heard of his him through his um, contributions to the storm society exhibitions but he did a lot more than that and uh, you know this this um this work this work he has here this design on the front and others uh, around the same time were of course done at the same time as as the storm uh, the storm society exhibitions uh, on the left we have a, a, someone who really is uh, important to the one chapter in this book uh, Guo Jianying, who is, uh, I, will, I will get into why he's so important, but this is interesting because this is dreaming of Jean Cocteau, it says these, uh, here, oh, I can show you here. Um, can we see that? Not really. But anyway. Okay, so dreaming of Jean Cocteau, and that, that's quite important for uh, as we go along. The other two, uh, examples of this magazine. Again, this is a short-lived magazine and there are only four issues. These were actually, um, the, the editors of this magazine were Ye Ling Feng and Mu Shiying. So Mu Shiying, uh, who, who features heavily in the book, um, was editor of this. And that, that, that those two editors are very important when it comes to the second part of the book, and we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Um, I, I should say at this point that I'm also grateful to Claire, Le the uh, estate of Claire Layton for letting me uh, print, reprint this. Uh, I, we, we, I, I identified it with a lot of a lot of trouble, I have to say, um, as being by Claire Layton at the Wuthering Heights. But this was one of uh, the interests of both Yelling Fong, uh, this uh, sort of uh, British and American woodcuts, uh, and of Shao Sunne, who we will look at in a minute. Okay, so these are the illustrations from my first story, and these are by Huang Miaozi. Um, they're from High Lai Scenes, uh, which I mentioned before. Uh, and they were written by He Ying when he was about 18 years old. And the, the point about these stories is not that they are necessarily uh, very exciting uh, stories within themselves, it's, it's actually the way they are written which is most important. And we can see the influence of Mu Ying in He Ying's work. Uh, also, I, I, what I wanted to do is include um, uh, short stories that were in pictorial magazines. And so one of the reasons is, you know, you read a pictorial magazine and lots of different things uh, come up, lots of different topics, and then there's a short story. So that's exactly why, why I include these here. Okay, so part two, Lu Xun. Art aficionado and critic. Now, in the past, I've always avoided talking about Lucien because I, you know, I just used to think, oh well, he's overdone. But in fact, in this in this book, he plays quite a, a big role um, because I realise how important he is to what I want to talk about. Um, and one of those things is uh, his his interest in obviously politics, art, and art uh, and literature. And uh, the, what I've done in this uh, the book is I've spoken about his the book lists, basically the lists that he bought, uh, of the books he bought, which are available in his diaries, and also about the films later on, the films that he liked to watch. And a lot of things come up from, from doing this. So we'll come to politics in a minute when I show you some more slides. Then we have 
the two stories here, uh, this story two and story three, uh, they're both by Mushi. Uh, the first one, Camel Nietzscheanist and Woman. When I when I started uh, translating these, none of these had been translated before. Unfortunately, uh, you know, I, when I got to the end and before I published the book, uh, another version came out, which I'm, I'm sure is very good, and I, I invite people to read it. Um, but I haven't read it for the per because I wanted to translate my own version. But anyway, so there we are. Uh, so chapter four, two critiques by Lucien. And these are really important to this book because they show, uh, I mean, you know, I'm not the first person to talk about Lucien and how he took dislikes to people and how he's terribly sarcastic about certain people. And two of those people are uh, um, uh, Mu and particularly Ye Ling Feng. So his two critiques are about um, the magazine, Wuni Hua Bao. Uh, and what happened was I was going to write about Wuni Hua Bao to start with, and I, I translated this um, story, The Lady in the Inky Green Chong, Chong Sam, and then found that um, Lucien had done this critique of it, which I mean, he absolutely hated it. Uh, for various reasons, and we won't necessarily go into that at the moment. And then uh, further down my research uh, line, I, I found that Ye Ling Feng had written his own um, essay about Lucian's critique. So, you know, it gave me a lot of material to work with. I'm sure there are people here who knew that already, but uh, that was uh, that was new to me at the time. And one of the things he really, uh, Lucian really digs into, what he really doesn't like is, uh, the story, the lady in the green chong sam. I will, um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But for those eagle eyed who can read Chinese, it says, uh, you know, shan as in uh, chen shan or uh, as in chung shan. Uh, well, I'm assuming it's chung shan because, because the uh, chi pao or chong, chong sam was the, um, was the most iconic of uh, ways to dress in, in that period. And the uh, story takes place in a nightclub. And it, I think it would be a rather strange for him to talk about women in yellow shirts, green shirts, orange shirts, when what he means is women in uh, green, yellow, and orange uh, chong sam. Anyway, I go to the, into that in a little essay. I have a little essay before each of these uh, translations. Okay, so this is to do with Lucien. Lucien hated, this is when he was about on the left, and this is why he hated it to start with. Uh, there are two reasons. This is his sec in his second essay. He doesn't like the fact that these uh, George Gross's works were reproduced in these different colors, blue, black, and pink. Uh, and I think, you know, actually he's quite right in that. Um, uh, but it, that, that doesn't really matter. The, the important thing that he did these critiques about George Gross. And George Gross was one of several artists that he really had a, 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 um, a liking for. He was uh, really very, very interested in George Gross. And how did he come about, how did he come to know George Gross? It was in fact through Yanase Masamu, a Japanese writer who, who wrote this book, um, the proletarian artist George Gross. And uh, we can see again from uh, Lucian's book lists that he had a copy of this book and, and, and another by Yanase Musamo. Uh, but you know, th this is an important thing because it basically we can see through these and we can see um, how these artists, which in includes Kate Kovitz a bit later, um, uh, Franz Masseri, how they actually entered into sort of the, the general um, so the general life, I don't know what to, uh, of uh, artists and writers of the time. Okay. So that's another, that's an example of George Gross in China. So on the right, it's a, it's an, it's a um, caricature by George Gross. And on the left, it's a Chinese version of this, which is so similar um, to the point of the old lady holding a, a child in her arms. But this is something also that Yanase Masamu did. And I would like, it was, it's a, I should have included some of his images here because he is a particularly important artist in this area. Okay, then we come to Franz Masseril. So he's another person who was introduced by Lucien. Um, and we, we see lot, many, many books of his um, 
woodcuts wood without uh, words. You know, this basically Masaryl was well known for writing stories without words. And uh, the, this is the very reason that Lucian says he didn't like the uh, magazine and why he hated this story, because uh, they have taken these uh, wood woodcuts and use them as illustrations when in fact they should stand up by themselves as stories uh, without words all right so this is what he says i think you know there's just he just didn't like yelling fung and mushi Ying, and those are some, those are the main reasons that he uh, was slagging these things off uh but so matter is very important and uh, that's uh, that's the whole point all these things that other people have then been you used in winnie hua bao Lucien had already looked at himself and he sort of claimed, I think he sort of thought it pretty much as his own territory. I didn't want other people standing on it. So that's uh, one of the reasons. Another thing I look at a, a lot is Cement Factory uh, and well, Cement by Fedor Gladkov, uh, which was a book that Lucien had in his collection. He had a Japanese, uh, two German versions, and he will have known of the English version, but he didn't read English very well. I say well known of it because the Chinese version, uh, the first Chinese translation was translated from the English version. Anyway, so this again is very important to him and this is an example of one of the books that he then went to uh, translate in a Chinese version, that is cement by Fyodor Gladkov. Or, uh, well, no, he didn't write, it, it's not, not the novel that he had reprinted, but the images from. And then the novel, the next uh, edition of the novel that was printed a little a little later was then published with the uh, with the images. Okay, and the other one uh, who doesn't need much talking about to do Lucien is Kate Colvitz. I'm not going to really talk about her, um, and I only really talk about her in any depth in the book because it, uh, for reasons of uh, completeness, you know, it's these these artists who are important to. Okay, so part three, the rise and rise of the pictorial magazine. And what we see here is uh, in chapter five, I, I have a, a chapter on the year of the magazine, 1934. Now, 1934 was the year of the child, the year of women's national products. It was the year that the new life, move, a new life movement was um, established. Um, and before, in 1933, it had been the uh, year of humor. So, but the year of magazine is different because the year of the magazine, they only realized that it was the year of the magazine halfway through, of course, when they saw that a lot of um, magazines were being produced. But in fact, they didn't realize that this would, uh, that 1935 and 1936 would actually produce more magazines. And so, although 1934 is called the year of the magazine by many people at the time, um, it, uh, it, it w you know, it wouldn't really have stuck um, if, if they'd known that in, in future, that 35 and 36, there would have been more. Okay, chapter six, Manhwa Artists and Pictorial Magazine. So this is sort of a similar to, sort of similar theme, but done in a very different way, because I'm actually concentrating on the artists who produced illustrations for the short stories I've translated. Uh, that is without Masaryl, who I, I've already talked about in the um, previous part. So Guo Jianying, very, very important in my book. Uh, Huang Miaozi appears a lot, and Ye Qianyu, who, although an important figure at the time, I don't speak that much about him really in the book because I've done quite a lot in my first book. Uh, and I've got the final story here, which is uh, called Attempted Murder. Now, this is actually a very disturbing story. I, I did think originally that I could read you some excerpts of the story while, from the stories. Uh, in fact, there was, there's not time for that because I've only got 45 minutes to, to speak. And also, um, well, I mean, yes, it could have been nice, but I haven't done that. So there we are. Um, Good. So 1934, and this is the new life movement. A, 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 we can see here Song Mei Ling and Chiang Kai-shek in the boudoir. 
getting ready. And it's just a joke. I mean, this is by, but why this is important is because it's a very good illustration of firstly, how the book Wan Xian, uh, not the book, the uh, magazine Wan Xian was directly inspired by Vanity Fair. Um, uh, Xiao Xunmei was the, um, the editor of the, and the owner of the company and the editor of the um, magazine, producer of the magazine. Um, and his artists, such as uh, Zhang Zhengyu here, um, contributed to the magazine. But what's important is that this is very much in the style of Miguel Covarrubias, the Mexican artist, Miguel Covarrubias. Uh, the whole, the whole. This is the magazine that is most like Vanity Fair. You know, if you compare it to Xiao Xunmei's other magazines, such as Shidai Manhua, Shidai Hua Bao, these sort of things, uh, he was inspired greatly by Vanity Fair because, his, uh, because partly to do with uh, Miguel Covarrubias and his friendship with him, uh, but also, I mean, he had been since the late 1920s very interested in, partly because of his lifestyle. You know, it was meant to be a very uh, sophisticated magazine and it's uh, yeah i should add that it's nothing like you the, the modern version of bandit affair which was uh, revived in the 1980s so this is a uh, you know a, a, a comic uh, um, inscription here or whatever we caption in the conventions of the new life movement does it not say something about hair must be frequently brushed but brushing long hair is just so troublesome by cutting hair short, no time need be wasted in brushing it. Furthermore, in order to eliminate obstructions before one's eyes, which is a pun on the current, uh, current, the current situation, I have decided to perm back the hair of my fringe in order to make a pleasant change, so the, the outlook of the future will show a great release of light. So it's all to do with the language used in the promotion of the new life movement. It's made, made fun. But the reason I wanted to introduce was, was to show the importance of Covarrubias in, uh, with some of these artists at the time. And of course, it went out of fashion a little bit um, when the war got closer. Now, these I've both spoken about before in my previous book. Uh, on the left, we see um, Chen Yuren, um, who was the father of Jack Chen, who, who appears in a big way in my first book. Uh, and this is uh, taken from a newspaper article by Jack Chen on his um, on the exhibitions that he was taking around on the world at the time. And on the right, we have Ye Chen Yu's um, illustration to the camel story. Okay, so here is Xiao Xinmei. Now I've got him here, although I don't really talk about him that much in the book. We can't get away from the fact though, that he was an, one of the most important uh, publishers at the time. So he is uh, the fact that I talk about Wan Xiang, which was his publication. I also talk about uh, Winnie Hua Bao, to which he contributed. I think you know he's important in this. And actually, I've since then I've done a lot of work on Xiao Xinmei. Uh, I uh, possibly too much work because I don't want to become associated too much with him. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be thought of as an expert in Shao Xunmei, but I am doing quite a lot of work on it. So in here we have another example. This is a portrait of Shao Xunmei by Miguel Covarrubias, which uh, when they met in 1933, in the middle, a portrait of him in Western clothing, which was very unusual uh, later on, but this was from 1925 and drawn by Xu Bei Hong. It's a very famous um, drawing. And one by Paddy O'Shea, who worked for uh, Shao Xinmei in his um, for his magazines, but he died very early. He was half Chinese, half Irish, hence the name. Okay, and so to take things even further, you know, we have we've so far had some uh, the introduction of George Gross and Covarrubias as uh, both. Um, important models for Chinese artists, a certain group of Chinese artists, uh, or in, in fact, to be clearer, two separate groups, because George Gross was very important to uh, some left-wing um, artists. Covarrubias was uh, um, important to the people who contributed the, more to these magazines. Here we have another example, which is Russell Patterson. So on the, um, on, this is uh, by Russell Patterson, and this is by 
Zhang Ying Chao, who was an artist um, who uh, who was very much in the same style as Guo Jianying, uh, who I'll come to as a more important artist in my book, and then uh, another Luo Bagao, who was um, also very much influenced by Russell Patterson. Uh, this the title of this is actually very interesting because, of course, I, again we will see here um, that if you can see a new sensation, neo sensation. What do you say? Neo sensationalism, neo sensualism. That's a, that's a, another one. But the, the interesting thing about this is, I think it probably is the first time that term, sin ganjue pai was translated into English. So I think that's notable there. I'm not sure about that, but I think that is the case. Okay, so to Guo Jianying, and he appears in my book for a number of reasons. He's an important artist in certain, um, in certain magazines, which in includes Shidai Manhua, but also in particular Furen Hua Bao, which is a magazine I haven't yet mentioned, but he was the editor of this, and he also contributed a lot of um, Manhua. Uh, and other textual pieces as well. So he wrote as well. But the interesting thing about him is he was really only an artist for uh, about uh, five, six, seven years. I can't quite remember how many, but not only a handful of uh, years. And uh, then just became a banker, went to Taiwan and um, laid low. Uh, but which is quite a pity because I think he's quite an important artist, certainly in the... Uh, um, pantheon of these uh, manhua artists that we now know. So, but this shows uh, a very particular interest of his, which is basically he has a fetish for um, mannequins and dolls, well, I don't know about dolls, but certainly mannequins. And you can see that very, very clearly here in what he writes as well. So I'll read that. He is a man who is addicted to the charms of a mechanical woman's body. It is just because it is an inanimate, inanimate object that he is able to sense its uncontrollable lust. Sometimes in the dark gloom of a sealed off room, he is enchanted by its new and original emotion, emotional stirring, its sense of substance and lure him emotionally into a world of poetry. Here there is none, none of that psychological and emotional morbidity and ugliness that is possessed by mankind. Here instead is a bright and unrestricted love. Here then are the most progressive and sophisticated emotional stirrings of 1933. So uh, this shows uh, his interest in mannequins. And this can also be seen in his, uh, in his drawings in general. For example, here, uh, which shows the, the woman who's the main woman who is in the, uh, the, the victim of this attempted murder that happened in this story. Um, she is described uh, as dumb and like uh, like a robot, and you know basically these things recur. So it's Leonardo as well who has this interest in it. Anyway, so this probably um, arose out of um, particularly, I, I would suspect, out of an interest in possibly George Gross's um, uh, drawings and paintings that have man mannequins, but I doubt that, but more specifically, probably in the surrealist examples that had existed for a while and then continued to carry on. It was a major thing for them. Okay, so in the last part, um, I go to the, the Shanghai Jazz Age. Now, so far I haven't mentioned music and most people think of uh, the Jazz Age as a um, as a period when music is very much at the fore. And that is the case, but it's not the only thing that happens in the Jazz Age. If we think about the Jazz Age in America, possibly if you want to bring in England and maybe France, these places, uh, we're talking about the 1920s. We're talking about something that goes hand in hand with the Roaring Twenties. And the term itself, the Jazz Age, was uh, brought in by um, F. Scott Fitzgerald in a short story collection in 1922. Um, 
but to me, the jazz age is much more than just music. It's uh, uh, the things that happen. It's the dance halls. It's the fashion. It's uh, the art, the literature, everything else that is happening as uh, that has been, been inspired by the jazz, uh, the jazz culture, and pretty much the dance halls in uh, in Shanghai. So in this section, I talk about cinema in particular, and there are two parts to the cinema. Um, I I look into the equivalent in cinematic terms of the new sensationists and how they were particularly interested in cinema. In fact, you know, it's after um, sh both Leonardo and Moshin gave up um, writing to become, uh, writing a fiction to become writers of, um, uh, about um, film before they were assassinated or whatever, before they died, yes. Um, so in this case, and where do we see this? We see this in soft film. We see this, uh, the equivalent to me of new sensationism in, um, in literature is soft film, so-called soft film. I'm not gonna go into what that is. Some of you who are listening will know very well what that is, uh, but it means, it effectively means popular film as opposed to uh, film that is there to uh, educate, uh, which, uh, which was what, uh, so there was a, 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 a some sort of disagreement between the leftist um, faction and the people who were interested in this soft film. So I look at that quite a lot, but I also look at Lucien again, because I mean, a lot of people have written about Lucien in cinema, but I don't, you know, I, I certainly haven't found very much about uh, wanting to admit that what he particularly liked to go and see. And we know that from his, um, his diaries. He writes in his diaries what films he went to see. And it's very interesting to see that here there really is a crossover between a lot of the people that he really disliked, like Mushier, Mouch Leonard, oh, well, not so much Leonard, uh, Yelling Fong, and these people, and what he actually liked to watch. Because you will, if you go through his uh, lists in his um, diaries, you will find um, interest in several Busby Barclay films and a lot of Hollywood films. So most of the films he liked to watch were Hollywood films, a lot to do with. Uh, on jungle themes, so uh, you know, lost in the jungle and all this sort of uh, thing. But and then particularly, he liked to watch, and it's clear, and not just because he went with his um, common law wife and his um, son to the cinema together. But clearly, he, you know, I mean, he, he uh, some sometimes, of course, he says that he doesn't like a film. It's usually, when he says he does like a film, uh, he um, it's clear. Um, the particular reasons for that, and there are a lot of them will be Soviet films. But he also liked um, these popular films, uh, such as the um, Hollywood films with Busby Barclay uh, interludes in them. And you can see that because he, and, and another one was King Kong, of course, a Tarzan and King Kong. And we know that because he went to some more than once. And one can assume that if you go to a film more than once, then you, you, you quite like it. Anyway, um, we come to the last section of this, which is uh, jazz and popular music in Shanghai's dance hall. Now, jazz in China has been really researched very thoroughly and very well by um, Andrew Jones. And for that reason, I've sort of ste stayed clear a little bit from this, that same theme. I do talk about it a little bit. I go off in a couple of different directions from him, but I tend to concentrate very much on the, the dance halls of Shanghai. So um, places where a lot of expatriates went, but also some of the wealthier Chinese. Um, and I, I concentrate on those because I, I am interested in the repertoire. I'm interested in the repertoire that they they used, um, the performers um, performed, such as you know the songs from the films of the days, from the day of films of the day, and I think that is extremely in, important to um, to to see the. Uh, correlation between film and uh, music at this time. So you will find that the, the films that are popular in Shanghai at the same time, they will, uh, the songs from the films will be uh, popular in the dance halls and cabaret. 
Uh, and but what I'm writing about really is how then those um, were Im important for some of the particular writers, rather than artists, I suppose, particularly the writers of Shanghai at the time, who, the Chinese writers, and how they interpreted what was happening in these bigger, luxurious dance halls. So that's um, and then I end with such is Shanghai. Now, such is Shanghai. We've had um, at the beginning. So this is Shanghai, and uh, at the end we have such is Shanghai. That's the um, conclusion, which is quite lengthy conclusion, where I go through everything we've um, we've been talking about and add quite a lot more, uh, and a couple of um, illustrations of this uh, da the dance culture, the interest in dance culture. We have um, Guo Jianying and his illustration to uh, Hei Ying's Shadow Wars, a very, very interesting story. And I had thought of um, translating this as well, but it just got, uh, I think, too unwieldy, five, five short stories in the book. This is very important though, because this is of course the song, Shadow Wars is a song from uh, Gold Diggers of 1933 with this very, very impressive um, interlude, Busby Barclay interlude. And so here's a, a direct, one of the direct instances where we can see this, um, their interest in Busby Barclay. Uh, I, you know, this is a very, very interesting um, story and well worth reading if you ever get hold of a copy. A lot of these aren't readily available. Um, I've got most of these, although some are published, I've got most of them through uh, newspapers. And Heying in particular was a very much a proponent of the palm in hand stories, these very, very short stories of um, just um, a, a few paragraphs which appear in the newspapers. And here we have a very interesting manhua by Zhang E, um, Bing Qi Lin, Yan Jing Shi de Bing Qi Lin, Ice Cream for the Eyes. I don't know why I put the Bing Qi Lin extra in there. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, this is just showing how uh, these people who were working in the pictorial magazines were interested in the ideas of soft film because the soft film it was described by the people who um, devised it as ice cream for the eyes and a sofa for the soul so um, this shows that very thing now the last thing i'm going to mention um, is about does concern music and this is a very tricky character called uh, Nathan Rabin, who was a gangster at the time he came, he dominated a lot of the um, bands and ended up being a, a property, a big property owner and um, club owner. But then he was caught because he collaborated with the Japanese and um, was, as we can see from what's written here, so I think, you know, I, mean, I wanted to introduce him because I know there's certain people in the audience who are very interested in gangland and this sort of thing. And in my book, Nathan Rabin takes a, a front seat, whereas in most books written so far, he's, he doesn't even make it into the furthest seat at the back. Uh, I think he's quite an interesting character. Okay. Um, what else was I going to say about him? I don't think anything. So what I'm going to say, because I've sort of run out of time, I think I'll just bring it to an end here. If you want to email me, please do. And please follow me on Twitter at, at Sino Bevan, and we can have some discussions if you're interested. Otherwise, please do ask me some questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for this uh, fascinating talk, uh, astounding images and the transnational connections. We've already got a one question from Andy, Andy Simons. Andy, are you there? Feel free to turn on your camera and maybe you can just directly ask Paul this question. Andy, you are muted. Great, thank you very much for this talk. It's uh, great to see the comparisons with, uh, I had no idea about this scene that you've researched, uh, Kathy Kovitz and uh, Mass Real, George, George Gross, goodness, and Vanity Fair. I have some a uh, book of old period Vanity Fair illustrations, so I could really, I could really lamp that. Um, I, I wonder if uh, you, you 
did mention that someone had written about jazz in Shanghai in the 1930s, Andrew Jones. Was yeah, that that's name? Andrew Jones and also Andrew David Field. They've both written one, one about jazz in particular and the other about dance halls. So okay. I'm, I'm, I'm especially interested in the Japanese scene. All oh, right. Because I know that uh, Shanghai being international was sort of a, uh, the libidinous safety valve of that part of the world in the way that New Orleans was for the United States back in, in the day. And by the mid-1930s, I think, uh, Japanese uh, dance bands playing anything like Western dance music uh, were very discouraged by populist mobs. So I wonder if any Japanese musicians then switched over and decided to live as expats and play that music in Shanghai. I'm not too sure about the number of Japanese people who were there. There were there were pe people from all sorts of different countries, bands from uh, white Russian bands. Uh, again, there are people in the audience who know a lot about this. Uh, it, what's interesting, though, is that a lot of these bands actually worked in different cities so i mean the, the, and the thing that connected them was the were the uh, steam liners so people were on bands were on the steam lines and then they would perform in different places the philippines uh, tokyo uh, yokohama shanghai all these places uh, all had uh, jazz bands um, performing at uh, in the uh, late 1920s and early 30s you know 30s as you say gets a little bit more complicated in japan um, Any other questions? Okay, I've got one. Um, okay. The title is uh, the pictorial, yeah, uh, it's the, the pictorial magazines. Hmm. I wonder how do you delimit the scope of your research? Because how many magazines are out there in 1930s Shanghai? How, how, how did you go about your research? Well, to start with, I, w I decided I wanted to look at some that hadn't been uh, researched very much at all. And that was why I did uh, Winnie Hua Bao and Wan Xiang, those two in particular. But um, on, on top of that, it's, it's looking at the, the, um, pati the particular magazines that have uh, the short stories written by the people I'm interested in and the artwork by the people I'm interested in. So although I do actually look at some of the, uh, you know, even Shidai Hua Bao, or Shidai Hua Bao, Shidai Man Hua, uh, Liang Yeo, some of these quite well-known magazines, uh, Fu Ren Hua Bao, for example, hasn't been researched enough in my opinion. And this is something I actually talk about in something else I've written, um, the, the problems of focus um, on, on magazines. What we have are some magazines that are really very, um, easily accessible. And so what happens is you get everyone talking about the easily accessible magazines and not as many people talking about the magazines which were equally popular at the time, but, but are now less accessible. And so what we get now, uh, if when people do that in their research, we get a very distorted view of the uh, Shanghai publishing world. The other thing that, um, uh, that, made me choose certain magazines again is to do with Shao Xunmei um, and his his importance and the people who knew him. I mean, so not all of these are, are his, but um, he did a lot of, even if he didn't um, publish them, he often print, had a hand in printing some of the others. So he, he's a big figure, but not necessarily in my book. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, uh, we can wrap up here. Uh, the official session is uh, is over here, but uh, for I know some of some of the friends are still here, so please feel free to stay behind. We can have uh, some informal chat. Thank you so much for attending this seminar.